A lot of my work is very layered based, both visually and, and hopefully theoretically. I describe it as distance through detail. Hi everyone, I'm Amy Devers and this is Clever. Today I'm talking to Beth Ann Laura Wood. She's a London based artist and product designer at the helm of her namesake multidisciplinary studio, characterized by materials investigation, artisan collaboration, and a passion for color and detail. Her work spans furniture, lighting, fashion accessories, and window displays. She earned an MA in design products from the Royal College of Art, has exhibited in museums and galleries internationally, has collaborated with brand partners such as Hermes, Abbott Laminati, Moroso, Tori Birch, and more, and she's a charming and colorful character to boot. Take it away, Beth Ann Laura Wood. I'm Beth Ann Laura Wood, and I am currently in London, and I do lots of different things, but predominantly I work within the design sector, and I uh, make stuff. <laughs> so can we dial it all the way back to young Beth Ann Laura? Like, I want to know what your childhood was like. You have such a colorful persona as an adult. I'm imagining the childhood may have been colorful too. So will you tell us all about your hometown and family dynamic and the things you were fascinated in? Sure. I think it, like the mid 90s is more there was kind of a bit cyber goth of a look going on or I was too colorful to be an actual goth which was more the movement going on in my hometown so yeah I've been quite dress uppy for a while. Um, I'm from a, a small town in the Midlands called Shrewsbury, central middle England not that far from Wales is is kind of how I describe it. I lived with my uh, my mum and my father and my sister and both my parents are quite creative in their own ways. So my mum would do a lot of sewing of everything and we, we would make stuff all the time uh, with her. And my father is an architect but he specialises in um, healthcare and uh, hospitals so it's a very, very different narrative of architecture that he does to the kind of design fields that I'm in but I I think it's kind of quite amazing how focused the the type of architecture he does to obviously make things work for a very particular function but it's obviously quite different to the kind of uh, colorful things that I do that's kind of my family and hometown. So surely that made an impression on you your young psyche did you have a sense of what your dad was doing for work and the sort of practical parameters of it? Um, I was very aware that my dad would point out faults in the architecture of many <laughs> like restaurants we'd go into in relation to health and safety or um, not being r- rhythmically even in the way okay. that they've placed the lights and things like that. So I definitely started to pick up on some do's and don'ts in the rhythms that my dad finds correct or aesthetically fe- pleasing in the interiors um so yeah uh, little <laughs> bits and bobs but he's not he's not a super super chatty guy so I've I've enjoyed like learning nibbles to do with what he does every once in a while I'll get another nugget though I don't work in that uh sector I think this kind of very strong kind of obsessional attention to detail is something that I um I hope that I carry over well into like my genre of work. I think that's kind of how bits of my dad's kind of work filtered through me as a child. But a lot, a lot came from my mum and sewing and sticky back plastic and toilet rolls and paper mache. And if, if I could make it on a kitchen table, I, I probably did. That sounds so fun. As you progressed into adolescence, did you? How were you expressing your creativity, and when did the dress upy chapters start? Don't know what grade it will be in for you, but it's year eight, which is like I think when you're about thirteen or fourteen. I kind of more consciously decided at that point, if I was going to have the Mickey taken out of me, then I might as well go all the way. I was getting teased quite a lot at school for various reasons, so. 
I kind oh, of. Oh, so you decided to own it. You took it back from them. Well, yeah, it, it kind of like if they're not nice to you about about how, how you are as a, like normally dressed, then you might as well take it full throttle to your own advantage and freak them out rather than um, kind of go backwards. This is a rebellious act of reclamation. I love this. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, I don't think the teachers didn't quite see it in that direction. I, I do remember being told to wash makeup up off my face when I did like dash lines with an eyeliner pencil for contours on my face. And I was told that's that's not appropriate. And I kind of tried to defend the fact that I probably had less makeup on than some of, some of the other students. I just had it in different places to where they put it. Um, but right. that didn't... That didn't work and I was made to wash it off so Ugh, frustrating authoritarian conformist ideals <laughs> I don't know it's a it's a weird one with school isn't it that it's mm-hmm. kind of like this kind of conformity of I, I do understand why the, the like the nice side of the idea of everybody having a uniform and and how that can give you a sense of identity and this kind of thing but it also can kind of reinforce an idea of one particular way of being being the correct way and no other way can also be acceptable. So, yeah, I I did rebel in my own small ways at school to try and find alternative routes to clothing. You were allowed to, like, sew your own summer dresses, which I think is kind of amazing that they still, like, your parents would still sew, sew your summer pinafores at that time and um, so my mum did and she made me a giant doll dress and she sewed me a a few variants on the theme of a more unusual cut let's put it but it wasn't the correct fabric and it was at the correct length so they couldn't stop me wearing it so your parents were on board you you got backing from your parents not resistance all the way around I'm sure there was times where my my dad may have found <laughs> what I was wearing slightly questionable, but he never necessarily questioned my right to wear it. So I guess it's not a surprise then that you ended up in a creative profession, but can you kind of add some more depth and detail to how you arrived at your decision to study design products at Royal College of Art? It's definitely true that that was to be... A creative or to, like a long time I, I wanted to be an artist because I didn't really know what other creative fields were when when you're little but I, that it's always been the thing that I wanted to do and kind of needed to do and then my kind of aspirations to go to the Royal College of Art were um, kind of kick-started by a TV program uh, on the BBC that was on the Royal College of Art and I watched it religiously every week and each week they kind of followed a different department and each week I was kind of like oh my god I want to do millinery or oh I want to do furniture and then oh I want to do fashion or you know sculpture and I just fell in love with the idea of trying to get to that place but I was about 16 so it, it was slightly more, I remember when, you know, you have to go to guidance counsellors. So maybe that was in sixth form where they're like kind of talking to you about what you what you're planning to do for a career. And when I'm like already like saying that's where I want to go, I kind of got a lot of slightly blank faces. But that was what I wanted to do. And that's kind of what I started to kind of aim towards from quite early on. So what were the college years like for you? And did you get to study all the different things that you wanted to, that um, your interest was piqued by seeing the different departments on that documentary series? Well, I think before I went to the RCA, I I went first to Kingston University for a BA and then Brighton University for an MA. And both these courses were very, very kind of materials-based and very kind of experimentative. I got a lot of kind of input in from those in terms of like thinking about all different ways of being creative and then all these different types of materials that you can use to make stuff. When I got into the RCA, it was kind of combining some of the maybe more material and these kind of skills with thinking in in a wider pictures or understanding context of 
different types or nuances of design and and what they're for and and this kind of thing. When I was at the RCA, it was the last two years of uh, Ron Arad, and mm-hmm. so we still had this platform system, which um, kind of wasn't always the same year on year. So different platforms would start up and some would finish depending on which visiting tutors were uh, teaching that year and also kind of the manifestos they were interested in exploring. So this kind of setup where you you had to also actively choose the platform you wanted to be on based on the kind of manifesto that they put forward about design or a way of viewing design. I found it really uh, difficult for sure. And I spent quite a lot of time kind of panicking and walking outside of the college. But it was really um, important to be pushed to kind of have make those kind of decisions about what what genre of design am I interested in? What am I going to be able to make the best work for? And also to see and and talk with different designers all already at very good level to get into the RCA and seeing their different ways of working methods. So like a platform called Platform 6 was much more what you maybe traditionally see as as product design or, make you know, uh, working with kind of the Dieter Rams ideology of like, com- you know, completely taking part a radio, every component to understand the function of each one and rethinking through the design purely based on the 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 function of its need and this kind of thing and Mm -hmm. then the platform I was on was all about the city and making work in reference only to the physical location around the school and looking for ways to subvert systems that are previously set up to create work that's intrinsically connected to the world it comes from but then is also you know making something different to what's already there so I really enjoyed being within my own platform, but being surrounded by all these different designers kind of off in their own kind of manifesto worlds um, to do with each platform. And it gives you a a better understanding and a better respect of the different credibilities that design has and the different worlds it can work within, depending on what, um, as a designer, your skills are best used for, if that makes sense. It makes perfect sense. And it sounds like you were also well positioned because you came into the RCA program or platform with a tremendous amount of technical material, hands-on knowledge already. So you were you already had a vocabulary you could use. And now it sounds like this chapter of your education was all about conceptualizing how to best use that to subvert or enhance systems or You can get a lot more conceptual, I think, when you're Mm. not struggling to learn the materiality and the and the physics of how materials go together. Yeah, definitely. Brighton, especially because it's 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 such a materials based course, and for the first like year, it's it's mixed with the craft course. Mm -hmm. So you really are learning and kind of designing, but from a craft point of view. Um, for that first year and then you kind of choose to either specialize in two materials or you don't specialize in a material um, but you do more more design-based briefs but this access to this level of design and then it's like I almost kind of would say because I like design teacups I think for my BA um, two different versions of teacups so for the BA, I kind of understood some parts of the history of the teacup but, and then the it as an individual object. And then when you go to the RCA, you're also kind of like then suddenly zooming out again, doing the kind of Eames zooming out movie where you see the context of that cup within the system of the room and then the system of the house and then the system of the social and then back out and out and out. So it kind of blows your mind. But it yeah. also, I think you know, it it should challenge you. So what was the leap from college to the professional world like for you? Was it an easy transition or was there some adjustment or did you already like have some jobs that you could work on? Describe the transition. I think for me, because after my BA, I purposely like took a year I wanted a year between finishing my BA and starting the MA so within that window of time I kind of worked out how to self-produce this teacup that I graduated with and I think at the beginning I was kind of been was doing that kind of naive thing where you think somebody's going to come up and kind of want to produce it for you 
And mm. then I kind of did have somebody come and want to produce it, but they wanted to use it for a very different context to what it was designed for. And I kind of had a talk with a tutor of mine from, from that time and they were like, why don't you just self-produce it if that for you fits better what it's for and what you want to put out there? So I kind of really did a lot of kind of hands-on learning of how to kind of make small things or something that you can produce in your kitchen and then get out and, and sell. So I'd been doing that between the BA and the, the MA and for the first year of of the MA or first six months I was still producing some small things or doing some small elements of set design so I think when I graduated I it wasn't like the thing where I'd only ever been in education for the last so many years it wasn't as scary it, it, mm. because I mm-hmm. think I had some of that kind of things that I'd tested before but I, I also was very lucky that um as a group we um, from our platform, we applied to a residency program in Vicenza because we really wanted to work with local artisans from that region and do like a locality kind of study in the same way that we've done in London. So getting this residency and at the same time, well, actually just before this one, I was invited to do the uh, designers in residence at the Design Museum in London. And so this kind of almost started straight away after graduating so I kind of didn't really also stop to panic if you get what I mean I kind of panicked enough during my time at the RCA kind of questioning why am I here am I good enough what am I doing how do I comb my hair how do I stand up you know all of these kind of when you start to like lose any knowledge of self um I'd had that window and with the help of Jürgen and Martino kind of grappled out of it so I kind of wasn't ready to go back into the kind of hole of self-doubt so I kind of just Jürgen Bay and Martina Bamper, you're, you're referring to your, your mentors, yeah. Yeah, they were my tutors at the RCA, and they were, were wonderful tutors. I see um, Jürgen uh, not as often because he's he's not based in the UK, and Martino I see all the time because we're uh, neighbours from where I live now, and he's continued to be um, an amazing a uh, creative friend and also someone that I trust a lot uh, for his opinion about things and about ways of working. Um, but they were really fantastic to have as tutors because they both have a really amazing kind of strength in their own identities, but the way that they work is quite different. So you would get quite strong views about ways of working, but you would then have to really choose like what bits from the Martino way kind of worked for you and what bits from Jürgen and then kind of find your own language rather than I don't know maybe if they'd been both very similar in the way that they work and approach in all stages whether you would have then kind of been forced to kind of question or choose a little bit how to digest that kind of uh, information into your own work so I think it was yeah they I really enjoyed having them very much as my tutors. So this residency in Vincenza came on the heels of a residency at the London Design Museum. And yeah, they kind of overlapped, yeah. And then I know you've you've done other residencies as well, including one with the W Hotels in Mexico mm. City. Can you talk a little bit about the residency experience and how it informs your practice? With residencies, it, I'm not so much now, but traditionally there's more commonly residencies for creativity but they normally don't always look for design-based practices Um, it's normally a fine art sometimes fashion music uh, performance or movement these kind of things in a lot of residencies so I think when we when we applied for this first residency we really wanted to kind of push to show how residential kind of residency-based works could really be informative within a design-based practice Mm -hmm. or a design-based manifesto. And um, I think with with this kind of thing, when you kind of put your wishes out there or you make, like at the Design Museum, I kind of spent all the money we were given that was like, some of it was meant to be for production and some was meant to be for you um, to do whatever or to grow your practice in whatever you see fit. And I kind of spent every penny I had to make 
this kind of intense marketry cabinet because I really I wasn't sure whether I'd get the opportunity again to make something that was really based on such complexity without necessarily having um, someone to purchase it at the end. Um, but yeah. by doing that, it really allowed me to kind of put out there this kind of direction and a, and a very kind of specific idea of working which then fed back to then getting residency offers off off that work so I'm I kind of I'm a strong believer in when you really want to work with in a particular way sometimes you know the best way to get that work is to start and put it out there as kind of like a calling card and then you know people then start to kind of call back or hopefully do um, with more opportunities that take you in that kind of direction. So it kind of happened a little bit like that with the residency projects. And then with the with the one with W Hotels, that was actually Design Miami Basel for the Designer of the Future Award. Again, uh, Lady Luck was hanging out with me um, <laughs> because I think this, that, that was the only year that they did the award sponsored by W Hotels and where they decided to do it in this kind of residency style. So um, each designer was sent to a different country where they were refurbishing or building a new W hotel. And when we were asked specifically to make work about the place that we, where the hotel was going to be because the W's try and have some of the identity of their location within their interior design and kind of architectural styling um, for each hotel. So it was, you know, perfect fit for the way in which I like to work. And then when they told me a hotel was in Mexico, I was more than happy with this with this choice. And um, it kind of has stuck with me ever since. I'm still making work inspired by Mexico. And um, it definitely had a massive influence on a lot of things to do with my work, especially color. Did you uh, enjoy your time in Mexico City? I loved it. It was amazing. I had a, um, who's now actually a very good friend of mine and uh, his London studio is in the same warehouse as me, um, a m wonderful designer called Fernando Lupos. He mm -hmm. um, was, was, he was either still interning for me or he'd just been interning for me. But I met him when he was a student at um, Central St. Martins. And so when I went to Mexico uh, City in February, he by chance was also going to be there because it was much cheaper for him to see his parents in February than at, on Christmas, you know, for Christmas. So I had like the most amazing tour guide in F Fernando, like taking me around all these different places of the city and the markets and explaining to me about the different murals everywhere and some of the architectural history. And it was like an amazing crash course on the city. And then I had from the hotel, they like, they kind of gave me a driver because I think they were slightly concerned when I was still quite dressed up and planning to go and walk around markets and things. Um, so that obviously made things quite uh, handy when you have a driver that you can kind of show for yourselves around. But without having the, the lovely driver, I would have never... I would have never seen the new basilica of the Lady of Guadalupe because this was something he recommended um, oh, yeah. that I might want to see because we were, it was the day I was to go to the pyramids and um, Fernando was like, you know what, I've seen them so many times, you you can do this one on your own. And so um, I went to see the pyramids on my own and the driver just um, asked if I wanted to see this church and I kind of was like, well, okay, you know, churches mm -hmm. can be cool, I like stained glass windows. And then we like literally turned up to the mothership, which is this amazing kind of brutalist spaceship, the, the new basilica with this panoramic spherical uh, architecture and the most beautiful stained glass windows I've ever seen. And I just, I fell in love. And, um, and the driver was slightly perplexed why I wasn't like kind of spending loads of time on the conveyor belt in front of the um, painting of um, the Lady of Guadalupe the, um, canvas um, because I was just kind of licking the walls of these kind of mass stained glass windows. Yeah, that was an amazing experience. So, um, yeah, the, going to Mexico City for this this kind of very intense week was just mind-blowing. Yeah, and, th and then I found... Various ways to get myself back there over the, the 
the years since because I just love uh, Mexico City and and now I've I've been to a few other parts of Mexico like uh, Chiapas and um, you know it's just amazing the craft and the color and the kind of details that build up the kind of visual language of Mexico it's, it's beautiful. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I lo- I love Mexico and I love Mexico City. I'm glad you had that experience and I think those intense residencies, those those moments where your your job is to be there and be present yeah. and just do you. It's not you're not on a vacation and you're not doing client work necessarily. Those can be so enriching because y- you have to turn yourself into a sponge. And- exactly, yeah. I think that's the thing where it's like you're saying, it's this kind of sweet spot between not being somewhere where you're you're so prescribed on on the time of the client that you you've got to make sure that everything you're doing is in line with you know the needs of that client or the specifics mm-hmm. of that brief. And then on the other hand, like if you go somewhere on holiday but you spend it kind of frantically trying to like research, that doesn't make you a very good holiday buddy. Um, but <laughs> this kind of residency setup where you there is like an aim to get some things or even the excuse to like make a photo journal or or you know digest the photos because we all take photos of everything everywhere every five minutes it's also having having the structure around like editing those images or going through them and making cohesive referencing from those um those things that kind of I think help to really build languages or or bodies of research that kind of can create very interesting works so that part of your process is the not just the snapping of the photos but the actual editing process yeah I think that's and I've still got so because last year I was doing so much traveling and it was that was amazing opportunity but I kind of I still haven't finished going through the images and it's like it's almost like too much you know to Mm -hmm. to do too many in in one day but it's it for sure going going back through I think is very important because there's there's the photographs that you may immediately photograph and that take the good Instagram picture and uh, they can also be really amazing reference images. It can be combined. But there's also, you know, a lot of images that that might not be the most beautiful image in the world, might be the most boring kind of Instagram images, as I kind of uh, learned when somebody, I think very early on when I was in Japan, and I think I was on my eighth or ninth picture of rust in a, mm-hmm. in a in an hour's window and I was politely trolled that not every image is one that's necessarily needed to be shared <laughs> and um, sometimes going back through you kind of rediscover things that you've photographed that that yeah they're not necessarily beautiful as an as a photographic image but there's something in there that 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 almost is even more transformationable transformationable that's the wrong word um, taking liberties the language yeah, just going <laughs> dyslexic with my audio as well as my writing but they're um, almost like uh they're bits of inspiration they're they're fabric swatches in a way they're they're yeah. just information for a for a mood board but not necessarily a, a whole story in and of themselves yeah but, exa- yeah exactly but when you put them together and then you personally go back and review it it reopens all of those things. Oh, that's why I was interested in that. Oh, that sparked that, mm, that yes, feeling. Exactly. And that's what I want to explore in this work. So that's really interesting to me. So I want to talk about your creative process. You're notoriously or <laughs> infamously or famously maximalist. And your your work is, I think you even use the word noise. Uh, it contains a lot of depth and texture and layers and visual noise but not random yes okay so it it could be noise to you in the sense that different different people like different styles of music if we use audio okay so it may be very noisy to to someone who doesn't like so many notes or like it you know if they really don't like heavy metal and and it visually is like heavy metal to them then it may come across more noisy but I would say like what's important for me within when I make work is it has very set rhythms there's a lot of things going on but a lot of it can be broken down into being set rhythmical 
movements or, or visual movements that kind of have a structure to them so that it doesn't become too noisy from my eye ear point of view if that yes. makes sense no, I know I'm flipping totally from visual to audio yeah no it totally makes sense because I mean that's kind of where I was going with it too there's a lot of sound let's just call it sound yeah. because noise makes it sound like it's unorchestrated and it's not unorchestrated in the same way that Phil Spector did a wall of sound. His production mm. style was a, a wall of sound. It's very clear that you're orchestrating all of these elements into a symphonic presentation. What we're saying is that the melody is, it's discernible. It's not. It's just not minimal in its musical it's style. It's just not minimal. It's more showgirl with a layer of cowbells and, and obviously some Bjork. Yes. Um, <laughs> You know? Great, great. Now we're getting into it. That is <laughs> just running through her music videos in my mind. Oh, yeah, there was a show girly one. Yeah, definitely. She's done cowbells. For me, I would say a lot of my work is very layered based, both visually and, and, I, and hopefully theoretically. And I suppose a, a lot like when I'm asked to describe it for some particular uh, pieces of work, it, I describe it as distance through detail. So a lot of the like the marquetry works, especially the um, the moon and the hot rock uh, works from the super fake series. Can you describe those pieces for our listeners? So they yes. Can... So imagine your nan's kitchen countertop with the laminate in your chicken shop meets highbrow Memphis laminates and then glittery disco laminates and um, very ugly kind of faux marble. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of all of those things layered and squished together to make large fantasy rocks or like uh, fantasy woods. The super fake body of work, one of the main materials that I class as being part of that body of work is um, the marquetry that I do with laminates. So that's taking all these laminates which are are kind of industrial resin and paper kind of plastic sheets that are 0.8 of a millimeter thick that are yeah. normally used on tabletops and kitchen tops. And, it's high, um, high pressure laminate. Um, yeah. Some of the main brand names are Formica and Wilson Art. And it's the type of thing, and yeah. Abbott Laminati. So I have to shout out the other ones. Yes, I and Abbott Laminati. <laughs> um, but it's it's definitely a very common building material. It's very common in countertops. And when you say marquetry, and I'm just explaining this in case our listeners don't, aren't familiar, it's a form of inlay. It's sort of like a puzzle, a jigsaw yes, puzzle. Yes, exactly. It's exactly like doing so a big jigsaw puzzle. Flush. Um, but you have all these different laminate patterns that you're sort of creating your own composition with. Yeah, it's making the laminates kind of have a conversation within themselves. Mm -hmm. So all these laminates individually, not all, but some definitely individually, I wouldn't say are the most beautiful of surfaces. But they all, they're very connected to different periods of time and like mass culture kind of aesthetics because laminate is a material that kind of only can exist through mass production because of the the kind of the industrial nature of its production it's kind of every two or four years they renew their collections so like a standard black laminate is pretty much going to stick around for a long time but a lot of the patterned surfaces some may only exist for like the two or four years of that edition book so I just got fascinated by all these different kind of patterns that are connected to different kind of aesthetics so the wood grain that I used within these kind of giant rock marquetry tabletops that I made is the wood grain that at that time was not being installed in all the KFC shops uh, okay. in London and then this kind of liney laminate uh, that's like I kind of call it gold lines this one is one that was designed by Soxas at Soxas, and it's so you you will see it with normally in its un kind of chopped up state on Memphis furniture. So I, I mm -hmm. love these kind of different worlds in which laminate kind of hangs out in. You're sort of taking that vernacular, as you said, and they're having a conversation with each other. Exactly, because for me, like that's when you kind of almost discover la how the beauty of laminate when you put it against itself you kind of start to notice all the little subtleties in the surface or that one has a texture and one is super gloss 
one has glitter, one has this, one has that. And you, you kind of can see the details within what you normally think of as being a very kind of cheaper, generic surface. Um, yeah, it's a way to elevate the materiality of it. But you're also having there's cultural context that each one of these has and reference. And yes. so when you put them together, I mean, I think it's I, I really love this about your work. You're you're taking what's not considered necessarily a luxury material and in the amount of labor and composition and concept in it, you're elevating it. And at the same time, you're not making it precious, but you're also elevating, I think, all the cultural contexts within which it exists and sort of paying homage to how the systems that they all exist in. I like to try and make things that kind of, there's enough there that I kind of give threads of what I'm doing, but I like it to be open enough that different people will see different things. So depending on, you know, whether you have an association to a particular genre or of laminate from a, t a period, or whether you see certain types of shapes or forms in the kind of rock patterns that I did. Some people see bacteria, some people see shells, some people see ice cream. And I love making enough space within the designs that I do for, for people to feed back what they're seeing, if you get what I mean. Because I've always been interested in how you make these kind of connections with inanimate objects. Definitely the, the marketry body of work really played and kind of celebrated this kind of way of engaging in materials. Is there a highlight from your artistic design career so far um, in terms of a project? Maybe it's not even what you would consider to be your most successful, but it inspired the most internal growth, or, or maybe it is um, just a fun moment of kismet, or is there something that stands out as a highlight or a milestone? I think there's two, actually, they're actually quite nicely related because the language of one is Totem is a project was the first project that I did with Pietro Vero who's an amazing glass artisan that I've been working with ever since I did the second residency in uh, in Italy so we did the one in Venice and then we were invited by the artisan association of Vincenza to then work with their artisans after doing the Venice residency and it's that second residency when I met Pietro and I made a single piece called Totem, which was then the first collection of works that I showed with Nilofar Gallery. This project is very special to me because it was my first conversation with Piedro and we've now been working together over 10 years. And I, you know, I've seen his children grow up from being like a, a young little boy with a very like high voice to like Laurie being way taller than me with a really deep voice. And we've really grown, like I've hopefully grown as a designer and a maker and also seeing his work grow. And um, so that project, I think, was a really special project for me because it, it gave me that introduction to him. And then a lot of other projects have come off collaborating with uh, Piedro up, right to up to like last year's Salone when we did our biggest chandelier together kite which comes from the crisscross language that was developed for the Mexican project but takes it in a slightly different direction with more references from uh, my travels in Japan and then another project which now feels very uh, timely that we did last year for the welcome collection in London which was the um, epidemic jukebox um, oh. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. who would know um, how uh, on the nose that that project would then become for this year. I mean, it was really lovely commission to be invited to do with um, a design group called Kiln, who designed the kind of body and the carcass for this jukebox. And the idea was that it would be playing various songs from history, be it like pop pop, pop songs to government sponsored songs that um, were all on the subject or dealt with the with the world that comes from an epidemic um, so I designed with Piedro because he works with Pyrex which is also a glass normally most most commonly known as being in your kitchen or in a science lab so mm -hmm. for me making these kind of 
discs and cone shapes all kind of referencing the different ways in which sound has been recorded over time from the kind of cylindrical Edison early recorders that were like a wax tube through mm-hmm. to the mini disc and the the vinyl. So we, we made this kind of, it's very similar to the totem pieces that I made the, for the very first pieces I did with Piedro, but it's horizontal and it rotates. So you can scroll um, a laser dial along the this body of this kind of glass harmonica. So it's oh. like there's an actual musical instrument that looks like, it's like lots of glass bowls. You can kind of play them like a xylophone type thing to make music. So it's kind of, a play with that and then all these different like shapes to do with recording of sound so yeah this is a project that I was very proud of when we made it because um it was really great to do something for a permanent exhibition and I thought the subject was really interesting and and I I've gone to quite a few exhibitions at the Welcome Collection and they always have an interesting uh, curation on their displays and then obviously this year happened <laughs> and so now it becomes in an even more kind of relevant piece within my my workload so I will be interesting to see when the Welcome Collection reopens what recordings will be put onto the jukebox uh, in response to the music and, and the audio things that have been made in response to this late, latest kind of epidemic. It becomes a very important tool of documenting this chapter of time, a, a living time capsule. I mean, for me, it was that's what I found fascinating when we were, we were working on the original uh, designs when they sent me some of the playlists that they were playing. And there were songs that I didn't even, some that, you know, are very obvious that you know that they're, they're about a particular subject and some that, you know, now as being a very 80s song, but it's also, you know, if you properly listen to the lyrics, it's it's very much uh, connected to the AIDS epidemic and, and this kind of dealing with the emotional side of, of how you deal with those kind of situations. And I think, you know, music is one of the creative fields that is so important as a way to communicate I don't know uh, what you had but even like for our our prime minister telling you to sing happy birthday to know you've washed your hands (laughs) long enough and this Mm -hmm. going viral and the there's the other one that we all know about you know you you pump staying alive when you want to give the correct compressions um, (laughs) to to resuscitate so I mean you know yes of course there's a you you can say what's the point in some of these things when if they're not like a ventilator but at the same time finding ways for people to communicate in in a way that people can kind of understand in a very basic way is really really powerful and also creating songs or musical ways for collective grief yeah to, to come together you know is 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 mm-hmm. really important because we are emotional beings that's kind of part of the joy and the and the disappointment of being <laughs> a human being for better or worse emotion mm-hmm. and 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 these kind of things are are part of us so i think for me doing that project it was so interesting to kind of really just get a little nibble into how that particular genre of creativity was become so important for for translating issues around health. Yeah. Fascinating. Mm. So, I mean, you sort of brought something up about the the joys and the grief of being human. And we are definitely in a time where that's being thrown into sharp relief. What are your daily joys and griefs? What what are you going through right now? Well, I I mean, I'm a very, I've been in a very privileged position with you know, I've been, I was working a lot uh, the last two years with a, an amazing client called Perry Jouet. So I was in a place where um, it, I, I could like not not work because we've been carrying on finding ways to keep the studio going during the more intense period of lockdown. But, it, uh, you know, I, I had some pennies to get me through that to an extent. So I definitely uh, feel for creatives and designers that, um, that, may have been in just off a period where they were had been doing a lot of like self funded work you know to then go into a window like this is you know it's very difficult if you if your turnaround is based on a very kind of tight you know in the same in the same way of a lot of other kind of trades and and 
non-creative jobs. There's a lot worse situations um, that we've seen that have been really difficult for people during these windows, um, let alone the actual reason why we're all in lockdown with the virus. So I've been very lucky to to not get ill and, and not have anybody in my family get ill. But it has been like, you know, it, like for everybody, it's been quite an odd experience to kind of work out if to work, how to work, why to work, you know, all of these kind of questions, which I think on the one hand can be quite positive that we we use it as a way to reflect on on the larger systems that we have set up and whether we take that time to reset or reformat the focus. But I think also on a, you know, on a smaller scale, you know, it's that complication of trying to like keep motivated to keep making work. And then I have two wonderful designers that work with me in my studios, had a responsibility to make sure that I could give them, you know, work that wasn't going to like drive them mad by just archiving things to do with admin in the studio. It's been nice the last couple of weeks to slowly be getting back to the studio and um, getting to work with each other if at a distance um, because I'm a very visual social kind of person and in the studio we really like discuss and debate and like be very physical with the way that we kind of work through projects so that's mm-hmm. been kind of more tricky some at some points to kind of find a way to do that from you know the zoom call so I have a very practical and very important question. It has to do with your look. You, mm-hmm. you put yourself together every day in a in a way that's very composed. And there are a lot of elements to it. Is that fun? And what's it like when you travel? Do you have like eight suitcases you need to bring with you? Not not eight. I'm I've got my <laughs> traveling down quite well. But normally, you know, I travel with like at least only half a suitcase there so I have half a suitcase to fill you know what's Mm. the point in going somewhere if you can't bring stuff back (laughs) Um, and then you know I was very luxuriously traveled on on a class that I wouldn't be able to afford by myself by some clients and when you're on on uh you know a business class you can have three luggage so I'm like I'm like there go guys nobody got the memo you can you can have three massive luggage like you can take whatever the what what you want back you know this was something that I've become very skilled at fitting you know um paper mache skeletons um resin heads um well, yeah, because these are various these things require careful packing too you can't just jam them into a overstuffed suitcase I remember once when I was flying to Italy to go and um, uh, visit uh, Pietro and we were working on, uh, probably it was the totems actually, and I'd found, it was just before like the Edison bulb thing, suddenly like there was a little window where we were kind of looking that we were going to move off Edison's and then suddenly they were like a bit scarce and then there was this kind of middle ground where lots of these factories that made Edison's realized that they needed to become even more specialist in the kind of type of bulb they made for the new way in which those bulbs can exist, um, which is a more decorative genre than purely, you know, for a strong light that can uh, last a long time and be better for the environment. So all these kind of bonkers bulb shapes started coming <laughs> out. And I remember I like found these massive kind of candle bulbs mm-hmm. and I was taking one of these to Italy and I had it as you do, rolled up in inside, I think, two or three pairs of my kind of hoedown pants, which I buy from the US that are basically frilly lamb legs. It, it's it's <laughs> like looking like a cross between big bird and, a, and, yeah, like I'm herding sheep in a, you know, Victorian petticoat. <laughs> and um, so I had this bulb kind of rolled up inside these leggings and then, you know, we were going through security and the security guard like got a little smirk on and he obviously thought he found something else in my <laughs> luggage and that he was going to just check on it to kind of embarrass me. Uh-huh. And I was like, you go ahead. Go right ahead. Sir. You go right ahead. And he was there <laughs> kind of unrolling down my um, my leggings to discover this very kind of large phallic bulb shape and and then was very perplexed and was like it's a light bulb 
Um, <laughs> so you know, I'm I, I'm I'm used to finding ways to carry things in my luggage. How did we even get onto that subject? You were asking me about how I dress up. Um, I like it. It comes from something I like to do for myself and a, m- my pleasure. Mm-hmm. So when I'm going to the studio and I'm not interacting with someone where my physical person is also part of the work because now I've kind of come to terms with the fact that my identity and my work have become quite combined Mm -hmm. when I was younger I was very kind of I had a I was very uncomfortable with people connecting my work and how I dressed and I I think for a long time before the RCA I, I was quite timid about putting pattern and color on my work because I I think I wasn't quite sure how to like I knew how to play with it within myself and for myself but I think I wasn't quite ready or I didn't quite understand how to do that for something that wasn't directly for me because I I knew I had a very kind of prescribed style Mm -hmm. and then I think when I was at the RCA I kind of Jürgen and Martina were like but that's that's something that you have that other people can't this kind of being able to put all this crazy stuff together so use it and put it in your work now it's it's more mixed but I tend like if I'm just going to the studio to to make things Mm -hmm. then I don't I don't really dress up at all I mean I'm wearing probably just very bad dress up because it will be clothes that I've bought and gone like (laughs) interesting but not quite right so I look more like a jumble sale reject I think when I'm going to the studio in because a kind of normal that's day what we have to do we have to wear the clothing that we don't want to preserve so it's all our shop clothes which are the clothes we end up wearing every day are the ones that can get ruined and yeah, which yeah. I mean we look yeah we look like the draggled clowns or at least I do <laughs> Yeah, that's. I would say that that's a strong studio look, the bedraggled clown, <laughs> the unwashed clown. Yeah, exactly. Or the troll, because sometimes if I don't wash my hair, it just kind of can, like I said, it's very thin, so it kind of just sticks up on its own accord, <laughs> like a troll doll. Um, <laughs> when I'm doing things like the Milan Furniture Fair, um, I think sometimes because it's probably the first time I've had a chance to dress up for ages because we've been working so hard in the studio, I kind of really enjoy getting to kind of dress up and play. Um, But then on the flip side, there is a window where it becomes, it voyeurs over into being like seen as a performance, which then I like not so into. So you've got to tiptoe up to the line, but not go over it. Well, let's say I'm a, a disheveled clown in the studio. I'd like to think that I was more of a cleaned up mm-hmm. clown during, you know, Salone. But um, you can't, it doesn't work if you dress like that and then you don't expect that people might want to think you want them to take your picture or take pictures with you. Right. You know? So right. Um, this, you know, I, I get and I understand. So if someone asks me, then I will take a picture. I don't, I get kind of annoyed when people don't ask and I can see them kind of hovering, trying to take a picture. And I might be in a conversation with someone else and it's not, I'm aware that the way I look makes people feel that they can do that. But mm-hmm. I might be talking with somebody that doesn't want to be photographed. So I get more kind of like purposely move out of a shot that I know that they're trying to take if they haven't asked me, especially if I'm in conversation with somebody else, because it's not fair on the other person. Yeah, um, it's interesting. It, so you're saying it creates a social responsibility because you are willing to be nonconformist in your physical presentation. You have this extra social responsibility for those people that are around you in terms of maybe taking the the attention from something and or creating a situation in which they're being photographed and they yeah. without their consent and and things like yeah, that. Yeah, I think I could become more aware of that the person I might be talking with might that might not be something that they want. Yeah, normally if someone asks me, then of course I'll let them take a picture or I'll do a picture. And um, but I I'm not really. I mean, if you look at my Instagram feed, it, I maybe I'm a very bad Instagrammer in the sense that I don't do any of the things you're meant to do to have lots of followers so I maybe post a picture with me in it like once every 15 pictures or Mm -hmm. less normally less I enjoy dressing up but I don't necessarily like I think I probably enjoy the fantasy of the look that I think I'm looking like than the reality of 
what I probably look like after, you know, <laughs> or, or in the pictures that you see of, uh, it's like when you look back over like the looks that you were like really, really into when you were younger and you thought you were, you know, that was amazing. And then you're like, wow, that, I mean, it was a look, um, <laughs> you know, so I, I mean, I prefer to be left in the fantasy of what I think it looks like when I'm creating it rather than necessarily the reality after like five hours of, being with um, an exhibition opening or this kind of thing. I, I totally understand. So let's glance into your future for a second. If you could fast forward 30 years, what do you hope to have more of in your life or less of? Well, in 30 years, I mean, I'll be getting close to the age where I can like be wearing a lot of lipstick because it will start bleeding into the cracks. And I, yes. can, <laughs> I can like be one of those ladies with like a harem of dogs. Mm -hmm. so you know I'll be at an age where it's you can start rocking quite a good look you know I think <laughs> at that point so you know so apart from lipstick on my teeth and and um, a harem of dogs um I, I mean I hope to still be making work within the design field and uh hopefully still being relevant <laughs> you know it's I mean it's quite a long time away I mean hopefully I'll be alive quite useful being creative and being within a, an industry that I love has been my aspiration from you know from whenever I can remember so my main goal is just to be able to keep working and creating and learning and 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 meeting new people with that know how to make amazing things or show me an, a material I've never seen before or Mm -hmm. that I go and get to visit a place or a, a kind of city or a location which kind of can share with me its unique elements that build its identity and, and be able to make, you know, works from those things. So, yeah, I I kind it of hope to still be like, working, basically. Yeah, <laughs> it does sound like a full, a full vision. Do you have a, a project? that's going right now or something you can talk about that's in the pipeline that our listeners should look for or pay attention to? Well, I have a few pieces that we, um, that were originally going to be um, at Nilifar Gallery for the Salone. I've been uh, working on those uh, pieces um, now uh, when lockdown was eased. So um, that's a new chandelier piece from uh, the Wisteria and um, tree language that I created uh, originally for Perry Jouet, who I made this sculptural piece called Hypernature. Um, and we showed it in first, we like launched it in Design Miami, uh, Miami first. And it's a body of work that I really, really enjoyed doing for them. So I, for Nilofar Gallery, I wanted to make a domestic scale piece that used the some of the narrative and the language from this work, but within the the context, within a scale or um, framing that could work for the home or interiors. So I have a chandelier piece from this body of work that will be launched at Nilifar uh, when uh, when she reopens, and um, a lovely mirror called Tutti Fruity uh, Melon that's from um, the first project I've done with. Um, small independent mirroring company in Venice um, and it was really lovely to work with them and, and kind of see what they do and they normally make the kind of very kind of over the top traditional kind of baroque uh, Venetian mirrors so mm -hmm. it was interesting to try and find a way to kind of work with this this aesthetic that they have in a in a contemporary manner so mm -hmm. there'll be a piece from uh, from my kind of first experiments with them and then, yeah, I th uh, hopefully there'll be a few more things coming out on the horizon. Are these pieces on view now or, or is there, where should we look to find them when they are on view? So that, that will be at Nilofar Gallery in, uh, in Milan. Um, okay. But I know that she will photograph the installation and, and probably make it, um, make ways for it to be accessible in a digital format as, as a lot of the fairs and galleries and practices were all having to uh, kind of find ways to make projects accessible um, in a kind of more digital manner. Um, so probably online you'll be able to find some stuff and I'll I'll definitely be updating um, images of the project onto my website when I 
have a moment. So yeah, the, those things will be coming out next. And then, uh, yeah, I, I hopefully I will start on a, a kind of body of work kind of based on some of the things that I've been doing during lockdown, some of the drawings and, and also all these photographs that I took during this kind of very extreme window of traveling that now feels, I mean, it felt decadent at the time, but now it feels even more. So, mm-hmm. you know, um, uh, I, I've got amazing pictures I took in the shoe museum when I when I came to give the um, talk in uh, Toronto, and uh, so there's just stuff like this that I just want to have like time to kind of digest and think about and and look how to make work that kind of celebrates these kind of things that I discovered when I was traveling, but also kind of can relate in some way to what we're experiencing now. Well, that will be really interesting. I look forward to that work. And I really thank you for, for sharing your life and your story and a little glimpse into your magical brain with us. Well, I hope it, it gave a nice bit of audio glitter to you for the afternoon. <laughs> Definitely some audio glitter. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for listening. To see images of Beth Ann Laura Wood's work and read the show notes, click the link in the details of this episode on your podcast app. Or go to cleverpodcast.com, where you can also sign up for our newsletter. Subscribe to Clever on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. And if you would, please do us a favor and rate and review. It really does help a lot. We also love it when you reach out to us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. You can find us at Clever Podcast, and you can find me at Amy Devers. Clever is produced by 2VDE Media, with editing by Rich Straffolino and music by L1011. Clever's distribution partner is Design Milk. <laughs>